Good morning, everyone. In Matthew chapter 5, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made a very distinctive statement. Anyone who is honest with the Scriptures must believe this because it came from the very mouth of Jesus Christ Himself. In verse 17 it says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And the Greek word fill, fulfill means to do. It means to literally fill it to the full. Notice verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass or perish, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Notice verse 19. And the Christian community should take note of this. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these least commandments and shall teach men so, teach other people to break one of the commandments of God, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do, that means do or keep the commandments and teach them, teach them to other people, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the very personality telling us to keep His commandments that led ancient Israel out of Egypt. This is the same personality that stood on the top of Mount Sinai and stated that He would make a covenant with those people. And He thundered down those very words, the Ten Commandments, with His own voice. And then the people said, Moses, you speak to us. Don't let God talk to us anymore unless we die. They were terrified of the voice of Jesus Christ. Why do I say that it was Jesus Christ? Because the Bible says so. That's why. And I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm going to teach it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant... This will dispel any lack of knowledge as to who was speaking on the Mount Sinai when Israel came out of Egypt. This is the God that spoke. Here it is. How that all of our fathers were in the, under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock, capital R, showing it's a person that followed them, and that rock was Christ. There it is. Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the one who led Israel out of Egypt. Then He gave up His Godship, you might say, and came into human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. This God is our Savior. This is the very God that said anyone on the face of the earth that will not keep God's law and teaches other men to break it, they will be least in the kingdom. But those of us who will keep God's ways and will teach others, even though our numbers will become very small because the world will not keep God's ways, we will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Notice now this same individual who led Israel out of Egypt. It says so right here. Notice in Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus chapter 22. This same person is speaking to Moses once again. I'll start in verse 31 and go through verse 33. Therefore shall you keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Neither shall you profane my holy name, but I will ha be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Did 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 say that the one who brought them out was Jesus Christ? Yes, it did. Right here, the very God of Israel that led them out of the Egyptian bondage said, I am your God. Who is your Savior? Who is my Savior? 
Was it the same God that brought Israel out of Egypt and then gave up his Godhood and came into flesh to die and shed his personal blood for our sins? Notice now in Leviticus chapter 23, because we human beings are the ones who broke up the Bible into chapter and verses. In verse 23 and 24 of chapter 23 of Leviticus, And the Lord, and we can say Jesus Christ, spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, plural, and holy convocation. A convocation, when you look it up in the Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew language, means a commanded assembly. Those individuals under the covenant of Jesus Christ and under the shed blood of Jesus have no option. It is a commanded assembly to keep the Feast of Trumpets. But what does trumpets mean? It's plural. I want to show you the only place in the Bible where a plurality of trumpets are mentioned. And this will be a direct fulfillment of the festival of trumpets that's given in the Bible by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The world won't observe it, but those who are under the shed blood of Jesus Christ must of necessity because Jesus said it is a holy convocation. We have no choice in the matter. We are to keep His covenant and to teach others to do the same. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse 2, when the seventh seal was opened, notice what it says in verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and them and to them were given seven trumpets. Here are seven trumpets that are given to the seven angels that are standing before God in the heavens. Now, notice in chapter 8, verse 7, it said the first angel sounded. Well, what did he sound? His trumpet that was given to him. Then when we look down in verse 8, we see the second angel sounded. That's two angels. Then in verse 10, it says the third angel sounded. In verse 12, the fourth angel. Then in chapter 9, in verse 1, and the fifth angel sounded. Chapter 9, verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded. And then we come to the culmination of the seven trumps. Then we have to turn to chapter 11 of Revelation and verse 15 to 18. This is the seventh trump. Verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded. Notice what happens when the seventh angel, the culmination of all the angels blowing the trumpets. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now notice also in verse 18, it talks about those items that will be happening during this time of the seventh trump. Verse 18, the first thing is the nations are angry. The second thing, the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets, to the saints and them that fear your name, small and great. And I skipped one. Thy wrath is come. That's a third thing that will happen during the seventh and final trump. And then it says, you should destroy them which destroy the earth. Five things are going to happen when that seventh trump sounds. First of all, God's wrath. Second, the time of the dead. Third, reward will be given to the saints. Number four, the nations are angry because Jesus Christ is literally intervening and going to overthrow for world government when they think they have their world government. Number five, destroy those that destroy the earth. Now notice, one thing that is talked about here is the reward of the saints. Haven't we heard terminology such as this happening in the last 20 years? Jesus is coming. 
Or has this been talked about before the last 20 years? The very phrase, Jesus is coming, was stated on March 21st of 1842. There were men who listened to a particular preacher in, in the 1840s, and here's what he said, quote, I know when Jesus will arrive. He will arrive between March 21st, 1842 and March 21st of 1843, end of quote. The man was Mr. William Miller, a Baptist preacher. He boldly stated that prophecy would occur on March 21st, 1843. The date arrived. Jesus did not return. Those who believe Mr. Miller's words were very anxiously awaiting the return of Jesus Christ, but he didn't return. Miller's followers were very, very disillusioned. Many of them fell away. They didn't even believe in Jesus Christ anymore. But somebody looked and said, wait, we made an error in calculating when Jesus would come. So hope was revived within those individuals. So they reset the date based upon this error that they found. They set it for October 22nd, 1844, a year later. They came to the conclusion, after studying the 70th week of the book of Daniel, that the year of Jesus' return was 1844. October 22nd came, just like Mr. Miller predicted. It did not happen. Jesus Christ did not return. They said that Jesus Christ must return on the Day of Atonement, October 22nd of 1844. This was according to Hillel II's calendar that he changed from God's calendar in about 357 A.D. A store in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania displayed in its window a sign. Here's what it said, I quote, this shop is closed in honor of the King of Kings who will appear about the 20th of October. Get ready, friends, to crown him Lord of all. End of quote. Now, along with Christ's coming, they also believed the end of the world was imminent. They believed that just as Lot left Sodom before its destruction, so it was that Jesus Christ would call his saints out of this world in what they termed a rapture before the world would be destroyed. As a direct result, farmers began to let their crops just rot in the fields. They all got together in groups waiting on the hilltops for the return of Jesus Christ. They left the cities and their homes and stood on the top of mountains looking for Jesus to return. October 22nd, 1844 came and went. Many of Mr. Miller's followers abandoned Jesus Christ completely. They used a phrase and said, where is the promise of his coming? Now when a person has been deceived, he'll respond by doing usually one of two things. The hardest thing to do once you're deceived is to admit that you have been deceived, correct what you have done wrong and what you've been deceived about, and then go on and be corrected by the Bible. The easiest thing to do, though, is just to try to justify your wrongdoing, your wrong prophecies, and say, I was wrong. See? Rather than correct that and admit you're wrong, the best thing and the easiest thing to do by these individuals was, oh no, I can't admit I was wrong, I just missed something a little bit and we'll rectify it. Mr. Miller's group decided to go by the second choice and justify themselves rather than admit they were in error according to the Bible. They explained that the prophecy was really accurate they said that Christ did actually begin his ministry of blotting out sin on October 22nd on the Day of Atonement of 1844. They said that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary. 
fulfilling the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. So a new religious movement started on the earth based upon error rather than correcting themselves. At a later time and another date, which was October 1st, 1814, another prophecy came. Again, many were anticipating the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Some of them feared it. Others stood in dread that Jesus would come. Others were waiting very joyously, wanting the return of Jesus so the world could be straightened up. But Bible prophecy of Christ's return was not to be fulfilled on that day either. However, in the days following October 1st, 1914, Bible prophecy was once again fulfilled. Those who mocked because Jesus Christ did not return. They said, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The Apostle Peter's prophecy in 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4, was fulfilled once again, as it will be many times before Christ returns. For nearly 2,000 years, people have been waiting. They have been looking. Every time a momentous event would occur in history, they would think Jesus is coming. It's time. So the false prophets would go out and prophesy, and they were found to be false because what they prophesied did not occur. So another prophecy was fulfilled after October 1st, 1914. It reads, 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4, There shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? Also, another prophecy of Jesus occurred in Matthew 24. Jesus said, Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. In Matthew 24, they even said, Jesus is the Savior. And yet they would still deceive those very individuals that agreed Jesus was the Savior. Deception is the hallmark of our time. The false prophecies in this particular time on October 1st of 1914 were justified. They said, oh, Jesus did come, and he came into the secret chambers of New York City. And he returned in spirit to this earth. On that particular date, he expelled Satan from our planet and then ascended back to heaven where he's now sitting at a chair right next to God the Father on his throne. He's now assumed his kingship. And dotted all over the landscape of America, we see buildings. On those buildings, it says, Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah Witnesses. Another false organization, rather than correcting themselves, once again justified themselves and went into yet further error. Over the centuries, there have been many who have received visions They've had dreams. They've literally had revelations of the date when Jesus Christ would return. This all has to do with the Feast of Trumpets because the Feast of Trumpets pictures the return of Jesus Christ. And yet all these men have a false Feast of Trumpets. Now for years there have been authors writing books, preachers standing in the pulpits, they have taught that Israel could not become a nation until Christ returned to planet earth. They falsely interpreted Luke chapter 21 verse 24, which says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. They said that that meant that there would be a dispensation of salvation through grace offered to the Gentiles and that Christ would not return until all Gentiles who were going to be offered salvation had, had received it. 
Then after that, the church would be raptured up into heaven and then Jesus would return to recall Israelites to the Middle East. There's a problem with that. On May 14th, 1948, the United Nations organization divided Palestine into Jordan, Transjordan, and the little tiny nation of Israel. And literal descendants from the tribe of Judah, as well as proselytes called Khazar Jews, began to come back to the Middle East and have been there since May 14th of 1948. Has Jesus returned yet? What about the prophets that falsely prophesied? Are they falsely prophesying of a false feast of trumpets? Or are they talking of the true feast of trumpets? But Luke 21 verse 24 says nothing whatsoever to indicate that the times of the Gentiles refer to the availability of salvation to them. It says nothing about salvation. To be exact, the Bible always interprets itself. This particular verse in Luke refers to the trotting down of the land called Jerusalem as found in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. I quote, The court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city, that's Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. The last three and a half years, the times of the Gentiles, is the last three and a half years when foreigners will come into the Middle East and someone will enter into the temple and claim to be God. Once again, a false prophecy. Again, men who heard this prophecy and all of a sudden there's a little tiny nation of Israel said, where is the promise of Jesus coming? All things continue as they are. Then on September 12th of 1988, another date Proclaim for the return of Jesus Christ for His church. A booklet was put out called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988. This was widely distributed by its author, who was a Mr. Edward C. or Edgar, I'm sorry, Wizenot. And it was distributed by an organization which is worldwide. It's called the World Bible Society. The date again was set after study of the scriptures and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy and also based upon the feast days of Jesus Christ. Only he used the Jewish days which are in error according to the Bible. Now the book stated that on September 12th of 1988 that would be the rapture of the church. But it didn't stop there. It went on to say that World War III would be fought between October 4th, which was supposed to be the Day of Atonement, 1988, and June 19th of 1989. Did it happen? Has anybody seen World War III lately? The book went on to say that April 19th, 1992, at sunrise, is the time set for the death death of the Antichrist. And at sun, sunrise on April 22nd of 1992, Satan will be cast out of heaven and will resurrect from the dead the Antichrist. All this was according to this book by Mr. Wizenot. He also went on in his prophecy to state that another rapture would occur on March 12th of 1992. And yet, Another rapture after that one on September 25th of 1995. He stated in that book that on October 4th, the year 2995 was the projected date when Satan would be unchained at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. And that would fall on a Saturday. Then at sunset on December 23rd, the year 2,995, 
the 1,000 year millennium will end on a Wednesday. Now, none of the first prophecies on the dates that he said, not one of them were fulfilled. Notice what he said about the 1,000 year reign ending on a Wednesday. He gave the explanation as to why it would end on Wednesday. He said that Wednesday is Satan's day. Well, there's a scripture in the Bible, Psalms 118, verse 24. God says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It did not say which day the psalmist David was talking about. But when we read in Genesis 1, the creation week, we find Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, all seven days of the week were created by Jesus Christ. Not one of them was Satan's day. Every one of them was God's days. So Wednesday, like every other day, is God's day. So once again, a false statement by a false prophet, speaking of a false feast of trumpets. Mr. Wizenot prophesied with all assurance that December 22nd, year 2999, ends the great white throne judgment. And it will end in the third level of heaven at sunset on Saturday. And finally, eternity will begin on a Tuesday in the new heaven and new earth. Well, whatever happened between sunset ending Saturday, what happened to Sunday and Monday? Mr. Edgar Wizenot then goes back into history to tell his readers concerning the development of Jesus in the very womb of mother, of his mother Mary. He states that Jesus... The egg was released from the ovaries of Mary on January 6, 4 B.C. This is wild, isn't it? This is in his book that I've held up here. And it states that Jesus' hearing began on June 18th of 4 B.C. Then he makes another statement. He said that after his hearing had developed, then Jesus' blood was developed on June 27th, 4 B.C. I have a problem with this because the blood is formed before the other organs of the body in a child. If this particular fact is so incredibly in error, what about all the other facts? So far, every single date that he stated was wrong that has already passed. Every one of them, not one thing occurred the date he said it would. Tragically, he made the following statement that has literally blown the minds of professing Christians. People all over the country have fallen away and they don't even believe in Jesus anymore because of this statement. Quote, No other time in all of history, past, present, and future, will fit all the New and Old Testament prophecies perfectly to the very second of time as the lunar dates of the seven feasts of Israel fit from the Day of Atonement 1988 to the Day of Atonement 1995. Only in the years 1988 through 1995 are the dates in the 70th week of Daniel in agreement with the beginning and ending of all the accounts of the days in Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation. End of quote. Because he says there is no other time in history that the, all the prophecies for the 70th week of Daniel could fit except 1988 to 1995, millions have said, where is the promise of your coming? Since there's no Santa Claus, what about this Jesus Christ bit? And they've fallen away. Just another false prophet has come on the scene preaching a false feast of trumpets. Some people bought yachts. This was in newspaper clippings that people sent to me. And they said they wanted to live it up before they were raptured away. 
This was before September 12th, 1988. They said, we'll let the Antichrist pay the bill. Others said that they wanted to have a ball before Jesus' return. Then there were those deluded pastors of churches, blind leaders following a blind prophet, and those blind pastors were leading blind congregations into yet further deception. The World Bible Society sent letters with Mr. Wisnett's books to owners of bookstores. They repeated Mr. Wisnett's statement that at no time in the past or the future will the Bible dates of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation fit except from 1988 to 1995. The facts are unfakeable, they said in this letter. Each scripture verifies the others. End of quote. Mr. Norville L. Olive, who was the executive director of the World Bible Society, went on to state in this letter to all bookstores, and incidentally it was sent to pastors, 200,000 of them, of which I was one of them. Quote, here's what Mr. Olive, who was the executive director of the World Bible Society, said. The elders at World Bible Society, with your help, have been ministering to 1.3 billion people in Russia and China over the last five years. Now again, with your help, we want to sound the alarm to the Christians across America. We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this message out. We're mailing these books to over 200,000 pastors throughout the United States and asking them to read it and sound the alarm to their flock. End of quote. He continues a little further down in the letter and said, I quote, We believe the 70th week of Daniel, the Great Tribulation period, will start September 21st, 1988, regardless of whether there's a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-tribulation rapture. Mr. Wisenot believes a rapture will take place September 11th, 12th, or 13th, 1988 on the Feast of Trumpets. And he goes to great lengths to prove it. Then he continued, If I were on a jury and saw only 10% of the evidence presented here, I would have to make a decision in favor of the evidence. End of quote. When September 12th, 1988 came and went, there was no rapture of the church. There was no beginning of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Many believers were disillusioned. Once again, they asked the question, where is the promise of his coming? So false prophets will come and they will go. How do you know? I'm not one of those. The only way you will know is by the words that come out of my mouth, whether I set dates or whether I don't set dates, or whether every statement I make is from the only book that counts, this Bible. The tragedy has been that millions have believed this book and then it was emphasized by the World Bible Society, and many more millions believed it. When we diligently study God's Word, we find without doubt we are at the end of the age. There is no doubt about that. The problem is Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My, and this is Jesus Christ who led Israel out of Egypt, and according to Galatians 6, verse 15 and 16, the church today is the true Israel of God. He says, my people are destroyed, or the actual Hebrew word means cut off. Cut off from God the Father and Jesus for the lack of knowledge. God's people need knowledge not the words of men that contradict the Bible. This book is the only book that counts. Not one word in this book has ever failed. Those who've set dates for the return of Jesus Christ have failed 
to believe Jesus' simple words. They don't believe the Bible. Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses' writings, you'll not believe my words. And all these people say, all the Old Testament is done away. It was nailed to the cross. When Jesus said, it is not. It will be here until the earth perishes. No wonder they won't believe Jesus' words. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, of that day, the return of Jesus, an hour knows no man. You don't know. I don't know. Edgar Wisenot does not know. He's proven it. Jesus said, no, not the angels, but my Father only. Only doesn't mean except us prophets. See? No, it says God the Father only. Jesus Christ doesn't even know the exact hour or minute in which He's going to come. The book of Mark even repeats it. Verse 32 to 37. But of that day and of that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son. Do we believe Jesus? Now if Jesus doesn't even know, who in the world is Mr. Wizenot and all the rest of them to claim they know? Who died for our sins in the first place? Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, or any human being? No, Jesus is the only one to be believed. He goes on and says, Take you heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. That's every one of us. And commanded the porter to watch. That's what all of us are to do. And he raises up some who are true and faithful to his word to watch as a watchman for the people. Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes. At even or at midnight... Or at the cock crowing? So what have we seen so far? At sunset, late afternoon, at midnight when it's pitch black? Or at the cock crowing when the sun rays come up in the morning? Or in the morning when the sun's already up? Broad daylight. Lest suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto everybody, watch. Why are we watching? Because not even Jesus knows the exact hour or day that He's going to come and how can anyone else say they know? If anyone says they know, they are a false prophet. They are not from the true and the living God. A vision or a prophecy or a revelation or a dream did not come from Jesus. It came from their own imagination or a spirit called a demon. After Jesus' resurrection... And just before he ascended into the heavens, notice what he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. This is the disciples. They ask him a question. Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Notice, it did not say which he has put in the prophets that I, Jesus, will raise up. Why? Because Jesus said, I don't even know. How's Jesus going to tell one of us when he's coming when he says he don't even know? Only the Father will tell him when it's time to come. How much clearer can the Bible be? Only the Father knows, not even Jesus. Now, Mr. Wisenot quotes in his book these very verses. And he states, he agrees that no man can know the day or hour. But then instead of saying, look, I made a mistake. I apologize to everybody. I'm going to restudy and I'll get it right. No, he didn't do that. He began to explain why he predicts the coming of Christ's return in spite of Jesus saying, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. Here's what he said, and I'll quote his book. 
if Jesus arrives at one particular instance of time, there are 24 time zones around the world. Now notice what's happening. Human reasoning instead of believing the clear statements of our Savior. Human reasoning. And each time zone has multitudes of Christians in it. How are you going to identify that particular instance in each time zone on earth? Also, there are also always two days existing on earth at the same time. Only at the exact second the earth passes through the international date line does only one day exist all over the earth. At all other times, there are two days existing on earth at any one moment. One day is coming, the other is going. So you can see the problem in trying to tell all the Christians covering the earth at any one instant of time the exact day or hour of our Lord's coming. However, this does not preclude or prevent the faithful from knowing the year, the month, and the week of the Lord's return. End of quote. Now readers in his book Notice that he went into a great lengthy explanation of a Greek word, knoweth. No one knoweth the day nor hour. He concludes that the word knoweth doesn't really mean you can't know. It just means you have to investigate diligently in order to uncover the truth. Well, Mr. Wizenot then convinced many people through all of his errors that he had put forth a great deal of effort to uncover the truth as to when Christ would return. But he was still wrong, wasn't he? Even though he wrote a whole section in his book about the word knoweth to try to justify him disobeying the very straight words of Jesus Christ. He did not know the hour. He did not know the minute. He didn't even know the day. He didn't even know the year. Jesus clearly said no man would know it. And that included Mr. Wizenot. His explanation of the, of the Greek word knoweth, when you boil it down, meant nothing, did it? Because he didn't even know after he said he knew. So it meant nothing. Notice what Jesus prayed. Now this is Jesus. This is our Savior. If we are under the shed blood of Jesus, this means something to us. Not Mr. Wizenot. Not another prophet who preaches false prophecies. Matthew 11 verse 25 says, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seems good in your sight. So just because Mr. Wizenot diligently studied and he learned the Greek and the Hebrew and broke down words and said, I've got it now. Did he really know? Jesus said he's hid it from the highly educated and the intellectuals of the day. To be exact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, notice what Jesus, our Savior, inspired Paul to say. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things, and the actual word should be ones, meaning individuals, of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak ones of the world to confound the things which are mighty or the ones that are mighty. They think they know everything and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things or individuals which are not, we're not wealthy, we're not rich, we're not congressmen and senators, we're not the jet sets, to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence." Why is God saying all the prophets that set the dates when Jesus said He didn't even know? Why is it He's letting them doing it? To see if the hearts of the people are right. Are they studying and believing Jesus 
or are they believing and following men? There's a difference. One is perfect. One is infallible. Jesus never made a mistake. He is God according to Hebrews 1 verse 8. It says, Thy throne, O God, referring to Jesus. God has never sinned. Men make mistakes. That's why men try to seek the shed blood of Jesus to forgive them of their sins. See? When we forget that Jesus tells the truth and men do the lying or are deceived, even though sincere, that's when we make our mistakes. Brethren, you do not have to speak Greek. You don't have to speak Hebrew. You don't have to be a scholar of either language to understand the plain words that Jesus said. Nobody knows the return of Jesus. Only the Father. Here's how you're going to know. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Here's how you're going to know in the days and weeks and months ahead who's telling the truth. Here's what Paul said. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Remember Jesus said, if you won't believe Moses in John 5, verse 45 to 47, neither will you believe me. If you won't believe his writings, you won't believe my words. The Holy Spirit inspired the words of both the Old and New Testament. The natural man, someone without God's Holy Spirit receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Why will people not believe Jesus said that He doesn't even know when He's coming, the exact day or hour? Because apparently God's Spirit is not what's leading them. Their own natural mind is leading them. I just gave a sermon about Cornelius, how he was a very devout and religious man. He was a wonderful person. And you know what? God had to work a miracle because he was not saved. He didn't have God's Holy Spirit in his mind. Even though he was a very devout and religious person. Are there devout and religious people all over the world today? Sincere, honest, but deceived. And they won't believe Jesus' words because they're thinking about the Bible with their natural mind instead of the Holy Spirit of God. If Jesus said, no man knows the day nor hour, not even the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father, why do people say the opposite if they have God's Spirit? That's, I believe it's a legitimate question. I'll continue the verse, 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural mind receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them because they're spiritually discerned. Why do people say we're going to be raptured before the tribulation when Jesus said immediately after the tribulation? Are they doing it through their natural mind or is it spiritual discernment? Spiritual discernment says I'll believe Jesus. He said no, there is a tribulation and after it, that's when Jesus will come for me. We're told by Jesus in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26, chapter 16, verse 13, that the Holy Spirit is what will teach us all things and guide us into all truth. If people are constantly preaching error after error after error, then they won't even admit the error after the dates have gone by and they justify themselves. Are they letting the Holy Spirit lead them? Honesty requires an answer. I say they are not letting the Holy Spirit lead them. If they did, they would admit error and say, I'm wrong, I'll change. They won't change. They're following their own human reasoning. That's all. There was a time when there was, this, was, this earth was very dark. Very dark. There was no spiritual understanding in the earth at all. There were no scriptures on the earth. Hardly. There was maybe one set of the Bible and it was chained down in a monastery somewhere owned by the Catholic Church. 
People didn't have opportunity to know what you and I have today. They didn't have opportunity to open this book, read it, ask God's Spirit to lead them into all truth. And one day a man happened to open the Scriptures and he read a simple statement. He said, the just shall live by faith. The man happened to be Martin Luther. Then another church organization started. Today it's called the Protestant Movement. God's Spirit showed one person one point of truth, then another one another, and another another, and one point here and there all over. And today we can look at everything that's said in this Bible, we can put it together and we can know the truth. Because God's Spirit will lead us into all truth. And the key is, none of these men were Greek and Hebrew scholars. None of them. And yet they learned the truth because they opened the book. Brethren, if you and I sitting in this room have God's Holy Spirit, and if you and I are washed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and we have made Him our Savior, our mediator, our Lord, God will teach you if you will study your Bible. The Holy Spirit cannot put something into your mind that you don't study. Our mind is like a computer. You put the truth in and God's Spirit will organize it in some way in our mind where we will eventually come to a knowledge of that truth. He also raises up true ministers that will not compromise this book to help lead you and the rest of the church into that truth. And it's up to you, though, to prove who those individuals are and to follow them as they follow Jesus Christ and do not twist and change His words. It's up to you. In 2 Thessalonians... There was a prophecy given because you see, people who are deceivers usually tell you partial truths. Jesus Christ said, I don't know the hour. The Father knows when I'll return. The Apostle Paul warned the church of Thessalonica that something would happen before Jesus would return. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians verse 1 to 3 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together with Him. This is the Feast of Trumpets, the true Feast of Trumpets, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, that means a demonic spirit, nor by word, nor by a letter, as from us, the true apostles, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Listen to this. It will not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now Paul spoke to those who believe that Jesus was coming immediately in his lifetime. Their lifetime, rather. Today, people are saying these things that it's going to happen in their lifetime. I say it too, but I will not set a date. But we do know the times are before us. Every single sign of the time that Jesus gave is here. However... He went on to explain that you should not be deceived by false ministers speaking by a false spirit, a demonic spirit, saying that you're going to be caught away. He said two things must happen first, and you can bank on it if Jesus inspired it in the Bible. First of all, he said there had to be a falling away. What do you fall away from? Buddhism? Come on, let's laugh a while. You don't fall away from a false teaching. You fall away from truth. You fall away from the one Savior and you give up on Him. Then it says, He won't come until the man of sin, we call him the Antichrist, is revealed to the world. No, the church isn't going to be raptured before the Antichrist takes place midway through the tribulation. No, the church is being set up by false prophets 
preaching a false feast of trumpets so that you and I will fall away and accept Lucifer as God. That's what's happening to us. Otherwise, Jesus' statement in Luke 18, 8 wouldn't even make sense. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, shall He find faith on the earth? Why would He say, look, when I come, I'm going to look around and try to find somebody that believes in Me. Why would that be unless that falling away occurs? No, the earth's not being taken by Christians. Christians aren't going into governmental posts and they're going to reconstruct the earth and set up the kingdom of God. Then Jesus can come. That's a damnable lie. That's to sucker people into this false antichrist system. No, the revealing of this antichrist, the man of sin, will happen before Jesus Christ ever comes. It doesn't take a genius. It takes a simple person that believes Jesus when he says it won't happen till the antichrist comes. Brethren, because of all of these false teachings that we're going to be raptured away before the Antichrist comes, people are going to say, where is the promise of your coming? They're going to fall away. Hopefully it will not be you and me. There have been books written. There have been magazines published by the multiple millions with false teachings in them. They're all saying the same thing. We're going to be raptured away before the tribulation. You don't have to worry about it. Not at all. That is false. We are not going to be raptured away before that time. To be exact, just in passing, Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, Solomon even said, look, there's been so many books written, it just wears you out trying to read them all. Have you been to a Bible bookstore lately? You can't find anything but prophetic books saying, oh, the tribulation's coming, we're going to be raptured first. Don't worry about it, Christians. False prophets. They'll meet Jesus Christ face to face. As I conclude today, I want to ask a couple of things of you. If you truly have God's Holy Spirit, I want to ask some things for you to do. Number one, in 2 Timothy 2.15, Jesus says, study. Now, we've all had grammar in school. We know when a sentence is there and there is an understood noun. When he says study to show yourself approved unto God, it means you study. Me, I study to show myself approved. When you come here once a week for Sabbath services, that's only the icing on the cake. What about the layer below? How many? Don't raise your hands. I don't want to embarrass anybody. How many are willing to study their Bible 15 minutes a day? Every day without missing. How many study a half hour a day? How many did I lose then? How many can honestly say with a true heart before Jesus Christ, they had a prayer every single day last week. How many have I lost so far? Are you studying? Are you praying that you'll be counted worthy to escape all these things? No. No. If we let things of this world, our business, our jobs, I don't care what it is, making a living, if we let that interfere with our Bible study and our prayer and our spiritual food, we're making a mistake. Nothing counts but Jesus and Him crucified and our spiritual condition all the way through the Bible, even in the faith chapter. It talks about people that wandered from cave to cave. They didn't have what we have. Why? Because they wanted Jesus. And they wanted that better resurrection. So much so, they were willing to sleep in a cave. Not our nice two-story houses with full basements and double-car garages. Two cars, sometimes three, and boats sitting out front. Oh no. If we're not doing these things, we're becoming spiritually deficient in nutrients. Look what it says in Acts 17.11. Paul was passing through. He just left Thessalonica. The people there didn't treat him as well as they did in Berea. Here's what he said. 
These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily, not once a week when they went to Sabbath service. Whether those things were so. How many of us ever get cassette tapes and then play them back during the week, stop them, take the Scriptures to prove what I'm telling is the truth? How many of us actually bring notebooks from time to time, write down scriptures so they can go home and prove me. I'm asking you to prove me. I don't want you to stand before Jesus and say, but I know I fell away, but I just got weary of well-doing. I got weary of study during the week. I mean, I had to make more money so I could have a better lifestyle. Jesus said, no, you're missing it. You read Luke. Those who went out, and it's called uh, surfeiting, caring about the things of this world more than the things of God. And so it got their mind off this book. And Jesus, who bought us from our sins, be careful. Be very, very careful. Can you bank on the Holy Spirit of God? Can you literally bank on the Holy Spirit of God leading you, you into all truth if you're studying your Bible and praying and asking God to show you truth? I want to just give one example, then I'll shut up. It's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 32. There was a man by the name of Simeon. He was getting very old. He knew he was going to die, but he was a very, very devout man. God's Spirit somehow had let him know that he would live to see the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I'll read it. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, the forgiveness of sin, the coming of the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit. Can we believe that Simeon puts his pants on different than us? Well, he doesn't put on a dress, so I can't use that example for the ladies. That he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit let him know some way into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, that's eight days, they had him circumcised. Then took he him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. I'm ready to die according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared before the face of all people, a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Brethren, I believe Simeon was led by the Holy Spirit. I believe that you and I must be led by the Holy Spirit. If our priority is not God first, you and I, just because we have a surface knowledge of the Bible and the truth, will not spare us when this period of time comes. Because you see, there were people in the past, Mr. Miller, who led millions astray in 1842, 43, and 44. Then there were in 1901, the Jehovah Witnesses started leading many more astray. Then there was in 1988, a man. And now he's even put out a new edition proving that he was wrong, but here's the truth now. Do you believe that? Well... If people can be deceived by those men, do you believe that you and I could be deceived if someone came on the scene with such power and glory that they literally commanded fire to come down from heaven and it did? If you're not studying your Bible now to prove all things and hold fast to those things which are true, and if you're not praying... But if your mind is on the world first and our physical comforts, you 
can be deceived. I'm not saying you will be. I'm saying the possibility is there. I don't want that. You see, I'd rather believe what Jesus says, that those who He has called, He will not lose one of them. Are you called? If you are called, brethren, Jesus Christ will be first in your life. If for some reason you have allowed things of this life to come between you and your Savior, I'm asking you to go home today. Even before you eat, sit down and read what Jesus said to the first church in Revelation 2. You find out what He said to it. He didn't find anything wrong but one thing. Read it. If this is happening to you, repent.